Hello, everyone. This is Rumble with Michael Moore, and I am Michael Moore. Welcome, everyone. Uh, wonderful to have you with me here uh, today. Uh, I just uh, I just watched Belfast again in honor of uh, St. Patrick's Day tomorrow. It's such a powerful movie uh, about a Protestant family back at the beginning of the Troubles in 1969. A Protestant family uh, living essentially in a Catholic neighborhood and um and how everyone for many many years saw themselves mainly as irish and not uh not so much as uh, a catholic or a protestant or whatever but uh because of the way that the british government ran northern ireland the way that the catholic citizens were uh kept in permanent second class uh citizenship and um, and then finally, in August of 1969, the British soldiers opened fire on unarmed uh, protesters, Catholic uh, protesters, and killed a number of them, including a number of children. And all hell broke loose after that. And so Kenneth Branagh, the director and writer and producer, um, who started it really in, in the year I started, I mean, with his first film, I think it was the first film or first big film, Henry V, 19, uh, this is 1989. So it was Spike had uh, Do the Right Thing, Branagh had uh, Henry V, uh, Steven Soderbergh's first film, Sex, Lies, and Videotape. Um, uh, and I think it was the first we saw of Denzel Washington in Glory. Um, it it was really, uh, it was an amazing year. I'm leaving out a lot. Paul Mazursky's uh, Enemy is a Love Story. Um, it's, I'm just, I'm trying to do this from memory now, but there were so many things, uh, Gus Van Zandt's, uh, drugstore cowboy and every, the, every festival we were at, Denzel was there at the next festival. We'd all see each other and Gus Van Zandt and, uh, uh, Matt Dillon and the others from drugstore cowboy. Um, wow. It was such an exciting moment in time to have my first film out there. And I was just nobody. Uh, from Flint, Michigan. And I, uh, of course, had never made a film before and didn't go to film school. And uh, at least I didn't think I knew what I was doing, but it turned out sometimes it's helpful not to know what you're doing. And it became Roger and me. And so, um, and so to see, you know, Kenneth Branagh's film all these years later, uh, now his new film, Belfast, a great filmmaker. And um, uh, it, it, uh, it's so powerful. And I, you know, I guess it's hard. It's hard for me because of, you know, most of my family and my ancestors are Irish and, and I know all these stories. I know that the stories that have been passed down and, and how they had to suffer and survive and uh, get by. Um, how many, my, my, my first, these would be my great, 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 no, great, great aunts uh, came from Cork in the 1880s. We still have the, our family, we still have the boat ticket with the three sisters on it. They were the first to come, came, got jobs, uh, came to Michigan. Uh, I, I don't know if they passed through Canada or whatever, but they, they came to Michigan and and they got jobs and sent money back. And so others in the family could come over. Um, and it's, uh, you know, and here I am grateful uh, to all who came before me, grateful to those who suffered Grateful to those who suffered the discrimination here in the U.S. No Irish need apply. Um, uh, taken off the boat in New York Harbor in the 1860s and, and forced into the Army. Uh, not go and settle a life here, but uh, they, go fight and die in a war for a country that they'd only been in for an hour or two. Uh, you know. If you're Irish, you know all these stories. Uh, if you're not, uh, you know, your people, however they got here, be it in chains, uh, be it that they were the first ones here, <laughs> um, or all the other all the other ethnic groups that have, have come here over the years to, to, to try to make it. Uh, everyone has their story and stories. So uh, these were these were mine. And uh and I've held them close and I remind myself of it and, and the empathy that I need to have 
as a, uh, a, a grandchild of immigrants it, uh, and to stand for those who are now being punished, who are now being discriminated against, never to lose sight of the fact that, that, that except for the, the first peoples, the native people who are here already, and the, um, and those who were brought here as, as enslaved human beings, uh, the rest of us all came, we're, we're all descendants of immigrants. And it is stunning to see the behavior of our fellow Americans when it comes to the treatment of immigrants. And I'll tell you, it's even more profoundly stunning to see my fellow Irish Americans, the, the level of some of bigotry, uh, not just to, to new immigrants, but to people of color, it's really shameful and embarrassing. And, um, and (laughs) those who live in Ireland and those who are Irish, they, they know what for years the people in Europe, in other countries, um, called the Irish. I'm not going to say the word, you know what the word is. Um, they were considered that of Europe. And uh, so if anybody should have empathy toward immigrants and, and toward people of color in this country, it should be us, the Irish, the Irish Americans. And of course, all my Irish friends <laughs> do have that and have fought for that and stand up for that and fight racism and bigotry and all that, but so, so many more um, don't. Saturday night, I was asked to be a presenter on the Irish Academy Awards in Dublin. And uh, it, it's, it's, it's called, the official name is the uh, Irish Film and uh, uh, Television Awards, or the Irish Film and Television Academy Awards. I just say, guys, it's okay, just call it Academy Awards. It, 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 we don't mind here. You know, it's not like, it's kind of cool, because I've been to the, I've been to the Irish Oscars, I've I've been to BAFTA, the, the, the British Oscars. Um, I've been to the French Oscars. It's called the Césars, and I won. I I won not best documentary. I didn't I didn't get that. I won best foreign film, and I was up against uh, Steven Soderbergh that year. Steven Spielberg, and uh, I forgot uh, another filmmaker too. <laughs> And, uh, and we won, we were stunned. You know, I went up on the stage, uh, to accept the award. It was given to me by the French actress, Isabelle Hubert. And, uh, wow. I was just, um, you know, I spoke a little French awful. Don't ever try that. Um, I've done it a couple of times. I mean, I'm there. They appreciate it. I mean, well, when I do that, but they, they, you know, they're like, okay, Mike, uh, thank you for trying. But, um, <laughs> It, uh, it, uh, I think that year was actually the year. Oh, geez, that's right. That was the, actually was the month before we invaded and bombed and killed civilians in Iraq, uh, a war we of course eventually lost big loser once again, but, um, I'm probably going to mention that here in a little bit because I want to talk about it as it relates to what's going on with Ukraine right now. But, uh, my thanks to the people at the Irish Academy, uh, for having me present the Best Irish uh, Documentary Award, Best Irish Documentary of the Year, and uh, and I <laughs> and I got to speak a tiny bit of Irish, our na- our native tongue, which is not English, and uh, I think I pulled that part off. I didn't hear from anybody because uh, we Irish will be the first to <laughs> make commentary on uh, uh, anybody who's up on their high horse thinking that. <laughs> They can, oh, oh, so you can speak Irish now, Mr. Moore. Um, but uh, no, it's uh, but St. Patrick's Day. Um, I'm recording this on um, on the, um, I don't know, whatever. It's the day before St. Patrick's Day, I guess, or sort of the day before. Um, always love this day, not for the parades and not for the drinking, uh, but for my gratitude. My gratitude for knowing that sometimes my sense of humor, your sense of humor, is what saves us from utter friggin' despair. (laughs) 
and uh, we've needed it these last couple of years more than ever. But the best part about seeing Belfast uh, today is that two years ago today was the last time I entered a movie theater to watch a movie. And today I called up the person who I went, went to the movies with two years ago today. And I said, uh, have you been to the movies yet in these two years of the pandemic? And no, 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 no. I know me neither. Um, let's, uh, let's do it. Let's just do it. We're good. We're good. We're, we're triply vaccinated. We've got good N95 masks. Um, let's just go do it. What do you want to see? I want to see Belfast. It looks like a, like just the look of it, the cinematography, it's just black and white, beautiful. I want to see that. I want to see it in the theater. And, you know, you can go on, on many theaters now and see how many seats have been sold and where they've been sold. And so this theater had 150 seats and 138 of them were empty. So talk about social distancing. It felt safe. Um, and I had already talked to people at AMC about their filtering systems and the things they've done during the pandemic. It's not what I did at my theaters. I went whole hog on uh, uh, big new filters, uh, air exchange, fresh air, new fresh air in there every uh, you know ten or fifteen minutes, just to make it as safe as possible. Uh, they don't do that in the you know the multiplexes, but they have done many things. Uh, to make it safe. And so it felt safe. And so we went to the movies. We went to the movies and saw Belfast. And um, wow. I was in tears. The final scene. It just hit too close to home. And uh, so thank you, Kenneth Branagh, for making this incredible movie. It is nominated as best picture. And I think a whole bunch of other nominations uh, this year for the Oscars, not the Irish Oscars, the American Oscars. And, um, but it was also personally uplifting for me to get out and to go to one of my, maybe my favorite place, you know, my real church that I used to go to two, three times a week. And now I haven't gone in two years. <laughs> if you could be in here in the podcast room right now and just see me how, how uplifted I am uh, and um, how glad I am to be alive and how sorry I am to all those who've had to suffer or who've lost loved ones. Nearly a million Americans gone. Well over six million worldwide. Um, so, you know, I think that's also part of the Irish in us, how much we care and how much we don't forget the suffering of others. So here I am reanointed in the movies <laughs> and, um, ready to go. Uh, as I'm recording this, just a few hours before President Zelensky from Ukraine is going to be on a big screen live inside the House of Representatives, where both houses of Congress will hear a talk from him. Uh, I'm sure it'll be a powerful and emotional moment. Um, everyone I know is behind him, but. Um, I have some things to say. He's going to make certain requests of us uh, in the morning that I want to suggest we pause and think about it first. That will be the next uh, 30 minutes or less of what I have to say. It won't be long. And before we get to that, let me just thank our main underwriter. Thank you, of course, to Anchor, but thank you to uh, this wonderful organization that has started to underwrite uh, my podcast recently, and I'm uh, very grateful uh, to them. And uh, I, like most of you, I'm sure, have had a lot of time to think here over the past couple of years, and that time has made me mm, curious. Uh, 
Curious in a way where a lot of the junk food TV and so-called content mm, can't really scratch the itch. You know this feeling, right? Um, that's why when you find something, especially during this pandemic, that is like, wow, it, it, it just kind of gives you a bit of a, a bit of a rush. So I am delighted to thank our new underwriter and to thank them for supporting my voice and this podcast. And they are called Wondrium, Wondrium, W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M, Wondrium. They are the streaming service that is made for lifelong learners. I hope that's everyone that's listening to this show. Whether you're seeking out, um, say, a compelling documentary or trying to learn about a new skill or subject matter, Wondrium is the place for you. Wondrium has mind-blowing premium encyclopedic programming on virtually any topic that you can imagine, all designed to move you forward on your journey to learning something new. There's some really incredible stuff that I have found on Wondrium. There's an incredible documentary on Stanley Kubrick's right-hand man, Leon Vitale, called The Film Worker. Just uh, it takes you behind the scenes of Kubrick and how he worked. Uh, amazing. And, and speaking of uh, Leon Vitale, who has come to my film festival in the past, there's a fascinating story of how this aspiring British actor ended up being integral to Kubrick's singular vision over the years, including auditioning, get this, more than 4,000 child actors to find the right one to play the little boy in The Shining, Danny Torrance. <laughs> Can you imagine that? For, he literally, I know, I know the story because he told me his quest across America, mostly focusing on the Midwest to find that little boy that had to be the correct little boy uh, to play uh, this role. And it spoke volumes about how Kubrick created perfection uh, in filmmaking. Wondrium also helps you learn uh, through engaging video and audio learning experiences, interactive how-to guides and documentaries. And it's all led by teachers and professors and experts who will inspire you and remind you of the fun in learning. So if you don't mind me saying, today is the best day to get started. Wondrium is offering my listeners, you, the Rumble listeners, a special limited time offer, a free 22-day trial membership to celebrate springing forward into learning something new here in this first week of Daylight Savings Time. But this offer will not last long, so please sign up today. To get this offer, you need to visit wondrium.com slash rumble. Again, that's wondrium, W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M dot com slash rumble. R-U-M-B-L-E. And in doing so, you can get your learning on today. And now, on to something very important that I want to say to all of you today. I don't know if you feel this way, but I feel this way. I feel, I feel that there are people that are trying to take us to war. And I'm not talking about the, the people like Putin. I mean, and, and if you've listened to my podcast and you read my things online and whatever, my sub stack, you know, uh, exactly how I feel about uh, Mr. Putin. And um, you know exactly how I feel about the Ukrainian people. And as someone who years ago traveled both within what was then the USSR, the Soviet Union, and someone who myself who then came back and traveled in what was the new 
Russia. And twice was present when Mr. Putin, long before he was uh, president of Russia, um, where he was present, where I was present, our paths uh, weirdly crossed. So my feelings about all of this, about what he's done, about the, the sad and tragic place that the Ukrainian people are in, none of that has changed in these last few weeks. But here's what has changed. What has changed is there are those who are trying to take us to war. And I mean, they're trying really, really hard. And some of it is very effective. The media, our politicians, our corporations who stand to make millions, billions off of war, Um, and you know what? I've been through this enough in my lifetime that I'm hip to it. I know when I'm being manipulated and I wanted to take a few minutes in this podcast here today. Um, it's, it's, uh, this won't be long. I just, I just, I want to express my, um, dissatisfaction with the manipulation that is going on so that I, somewhere in my heart, will eventually say any day now, we have to go there. We have to go to Ukraine. We have to go to war. And you know also, if you know me, I will fight that feeling every inch of the way because we are not going to war. As I've said before, we... We are such, we have such a bad history of warmongering. We've done good things. We've in the past, there have been some times where we've gone and supported and protected people and all of that. But generally, that's not us. Generally, that's not us. Um, we had, we, we are a violent people. And so we founded the country based on a genocidal act, many acts to remove permanently the people who were here first. And then our second original sin, that of bringing slaves here through acts of violence, killing a lot of them, hanging a lot of them. But we needed to build the new country and we needed free labor. And so, boom, millions of slaves and deaths. And what is my, our responsibility to protect the people here and around the world? Because we all live on the same planet. We all share that planet. So, but our actions since World War II have been pretty sad and despicable and wrong. Uh, Whether it was Korea, Vietnam, uh, Cambodia, Laos, you get down the, the whole list of things that we did invading uh, the Dominican Republic, um, uh, all, the, all the other, the wars after uh, Vietnam uh, that were started, you know, mainly by Reagan with, you know, Panama and, and, uh, and then the first Iraq war uh, under Bush the first, and then the grotesque invasion of Iraq in 2003. Um, And before that, going into Afghanistan without really a clue other than let's go to war. Let's go to war. Let's all hop on our horses and go to war. That's just always seems to be the first thought. How's that worked out for us? How'd that work out for the Afghan people? How'd it work out for the Iraqi people? 
So after these two colossal mistakes, um, I wrote a thing uh, basically saying that we have to go to the timeout room. We Americans, we are not allowed to go to war anymore. If, if there's a justifiable reason to help others who are being attacked, whatever, there's things we can do. And we've seen that in this case here with Ukraine, with sanctions, uh, with uh, defensive uh, armaments. There's things we can do, but we can't go there. We must not go anywhere because of our behavior in these last 20 years. We have to stay in the timeout room. And that's how I feel this week. But I'll tell you, I have to turn the TV off. Are you are, are you feeling the same way that you can't watch the news anymore? I mean, I literally have had to stop. I'll, maybe once a day, I'll check in just to see what kind of BS is being shoved down the throats or the ears or the eyes of the American people. And every day, if you notice this, it just gets more and more and more. And the story they want to tell, the sad story, the sadder the better, showing the Ukrainian cities uh, being bombed, showing people dead in the streets, showing the children awful, awful, awful. And your heart breaks. And if you care, if you give a damn, your brain goes, I should be doing something. We should be doing something. This has to stop. This guy's crazy. Of course, that's part of the debate, isn't it? Putin isn't completely stupid. He knows we like the bait of war. And it doesn't take much to get us active and to get us violent and to show up. Thousands and thousands and thousands of miles away. He's doing something on his doorstep. He's doing something to a country that used to be part of Russia. He's, he's you know, it's, it's, it's again, just imagine if he had sent Russian troops to Mexico or Canada here in the last month, where would we be then? Probably not in the timeout room, right? Yeah. But he knows us. He's got our number. Most of the world has our number. And what I am, what I want to say here today on this episode is I am begging you to resist. Not resist Putin. The Ukrainian people are doing a great job of that. I mean, how many, how many weeks have gone by where we still are watching that one, that one piece of footage of the Russian tanks and trucks on that one road? And like every other day it gets bigger. Well, it's, it's five miles long and then it was 10 miles long. Then it was 40 miles long. Okay. Well, hmm, why is that? It might be because actually uh, the Ukrainian people are doing what we would do if that, if that line of tanks or whatever, if it wasn't a convoy of trucks of uh, uh, Trump supporting Canadians, is that such a thing? Uh, coming across the Ambassador Bridge in Detroit. But what if, what if it was? Uh, Russian tanks and and all whatnot. Uh, what would we do? Uh, we'd have to probably say goodbye to the Ambassador Bridge for one thing. But of course, you know that's not what's going on here. And what what we're seeing every day is this kind of uptick in more footage, more photos, more. And they, there's one last night. I, I don't know. I tuned into one of the networks and they showed a. Um, a missile coming into a parking lot and blew up. I don't know. Like, I think I went back and paused it and counted you know, seven, seven to nine cars. And, um, and it was awful, of course, you know, but they made it sound like this happened today. And I'm thinking, dude, uh, you showed me this like three weeks ago. What is going on here? 
What is going on? And then President Zelensky, fellow satirist, uh, and of course, as you know, a couple weeks ago, he offered to, uh, you know, conduct any negotiations on his behalf to get this thing to stop. But he is, he's taken this position now that, that we, we are responsible to, we have to fly our planes and shoot down Russian planes that are flying over Ukraine. We need a no-fly zone. It has to be enforced by our Air Force, or we give planes to the Poles, or I don't know, each day there's a new method, but it's all about shutting down the airspace. But first of all, we're not going to do that. I don't know how to say this to President Zelensky and to the Ukrainian people, but let me, I'm just, we're not doing that. That would start such a massive war with Putin, with Russia. You've got two countries that have thousands of nuclear missiles pointed at each other. And we are not going to do that. Not even for Ukraine. And that may be hard to hear if you're a Ukrainian, if you're President Zelensky. But we are not going to risk the destruction of the world for, well, for anything, frankly. That, I know, is a bitter pill to swallow. But there are other people, Europeans, European countries, neighbors of Ukraine. There are others um, because it is their neighborhood and because they don't have our record of just willfully, randomly invading other countries and killing their people, bombing civilian populations like we've done uh, in uh, Iraq. Um, There are people that can help. Not us. Not because we're afraid. It's because we've behaved badly. And so we're not allowed to. Especially not when there are others who can help. And let me tell you who's helping, I think. Let me just offer a good guess here. If you watched Putin's crazed speech uh, from that table of his on the day he decided to go to war. The thing ran at least an hour. <laughs> you saw that, I never I never thought Putin was like just outright batshit crazy, but there he was saying stuff that I'm like, dude, you know, even though I, maybe I don't agree with you, but at least I, I thought you had a brain. And, um, and I think you, I hoped you knew what was best for your people and to keep them out of war and all that. But man, but here's the thing. You've got to go back and watch this. A couple days later, he um, televised a meeting with his top generals about the war. And again, he's at one of those hundred foot long tables or it's not that long, but you know what I'm saying? It looks like it's, you know, it looks like, you know, he's at one end of the table in Moscow and the people down at the other end of the table are in Minsk. They would cut away to the generals, like close-ups, two shots. And the generals were like looking at each other out of the sides of their eyes or they were looking down at their papers and trying to pretend they were shuffling them around. Or if I could have put subtitles under the looks of those generals' faces, it would have said, this guy is fucking nuts. That is the look on their faces. You'll see it if if you go back and look at it. They're, they're, they looked embarrassed. They looked like they were trying to look, communicate with each other because they couldn't say anything. Like, what do we do? I don't know. What do we do? We, we, we must do something. <laughs> yes, you must do something because he, he is going to get your soldiers killed. So between that and then a week or so ago, the various oligarchs, the uber wealthy in Russia, people that were had been made wealthy essentially by Putin and his crimes and his his dishonesty, um, but they started coming out publicly against the war, saying it was wrong. We need to end this. Stop it. Like like the top three or four, of the richest ones in Russia, were saying publicly to Putin, stop. And I have felt pretty much since last week, and again, I don't know if this will happen, 
But I think what may stop him and what may stop this war are the people who enjoyed their wealthy criminal life in Russia with their billions of dollars that he made available to them. They probably don't want that way of life to end. And a war like this could make that come to a close. So they want to stay rich, live rich. And, and the generals and the soldiers, they want to live. And they don't want to fight for something they don't believe in. And I thought, well, you know what? That is going to, that is going to bring, we won't have to really do anything, I think, here. Maybe in the next few weeks, the generals and the rich are going to put a stop to this. Either they're going to convince them to stop or come up with an idea to save face, or there may not be a Vladimir Putin any longer. Something will happen. That's, that's my, just a wild idea in my head that may be true. And you know me, if you've been with me for a number of decades, uh, you know that sometimes when I have these crazy ideas, um, it's actually what is the truth and what will happen. Um, so maybe not, I could be wrong. Um, but, but we jumping into this war and tugging on our heartstrings and, and today a documentary filmmaker, an American, uh, Brent Renaud and, uh, and, uh, another reporter for Fox news killed there. And, um, It's a good way to get Americans again, to get behind a war. Now they're killing us. They've killed American journalists. They're killing Americans. Did you hear me? They're killing Americans. Fight, 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 fight. (laughs) And I'm here to say that while I'm very sad about that, And I will remember all who have perished in this war, be they Americans or not. The solution is not for more to perish. And President Zelensky, there's not going to be a no-fly zone that, that the United States is going to operate. We are not going to send in our jet fighters and our bomber planes. It's just not going to happen. And for those of you listening to this who are thinking, yeah, but Mike, no, no, there's no yeah, but we have not earned the privilege of coming to the aid of others who are dying. We have not earned the privilege of that act because of our behavior, because of how many civilians we killed in Iraq. The numbers vary. It's all over the place. We killed 100,000 civilians. We've killed over the years, and this dates back to when Clinton was president, um, nearly a million Iraqis. Someday the UN, somebody will sort out the exact number, but you know it's bad. And for what? We wanted to protect our oil that was under their ground um, because of all the lies we were told by Colin Powell. I'm sorry. I know don't speak ill of the dead. Uh, I rode with him on an Amtrak train one time and it had a nice uh, conversation. Well, I thought it was nice. I'm not sure. So sure he did, but, but listen, um, we were lied to. We were sent to war between Afghanistan and Iraq. <sighs> what do we have? Six, seven, eight thousand dead American soldiers. I'm sorry, I don't know the exact number right now. You know, and if there's if there's seven thousand of them, that's fourteen thousand parents who lost a child. It's thousands of husbands and wives who lost a loved one. I don't know how many thousands of kids no longer have a dad or a mom because of our insanity. So no, President Zelensky, we're not coming. I know that's hard to hear, and we will help. We are helping. 
in every other way possible. And we will support your neighbors who I know want to help you. But all of this, you know, the, 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 the bombing yesterday that was just 10, 15 miles from the Polish border in Ukraine. And they all got on TV, all the politicians, all the ex-generals, all the pundits. Last night and today, the Russians bombed a, a base that was just a few miles from the Polish border. And all we've had to listen to today is, Putin, we told you, you touch any, any acre of land, bomb it, kill its people, whatever, of a NATO country, we're coming in, all of us, one for all and all for one. And you did this just a few miles from the Polish border? We're ready. We're re- Do that again and have one of those missiles go astray and come into Poland, we're coming after you. (sighs) That has been the drumbeat all day today. And I have to tell you something. No, we're not. We're not coming. I know people don't want me to say this out loud because we want to stop him. He has to be stopped. But The Ukrainians seem to be doing such a good job. You know, they have the third largest army in in Europe. The the way, that's another way they've tried to pull at our heartstrings. Look at how bad it is for the Ukrainians. Oh, all they've got are rakes and shovels. No, they don't. We, We and others have funded them to the max, and we have sent them so many missiles and armaments and tanks and things. They're a well-trained army. We're one of the countries who've helped to train them. I'm just saying we're being manipulated. And and who amongst you, I want to ask you, I mean, I know some of you disagree with me on this, but who amongst you believes that because of NATO, that we're in NATO, that we have to jump in if a missile hits Poland? Don't say that, Mike. Of course we do. No, we don't. Not us. Yes, others have to. Europe has to. But us? <sighs> By the way, first of all, as far as Europe goes, we've already jumped in more than once to help and have lost hundreds of thousands of Americans to help, to bring an end to Hitler which means I can't let that moment go by without reminding you that those who gave the most in World War II were the Russians, were the Soviets. Nearly 25 million killed in World War II, Russians, Soviets. To stop Hitler. Without the Soviet Union... A lot of people will say and will tell you, historians will tell you that the Russians had to really take it on the chin. And if they hadn't, we may not have won that war. They became such a distraction to the sick mind of Hitler. And also because this, all this Eastern Europe and that Russia and all that contains so many Jewish men, women, and children, um, the idea of just going there for Hitler was just like, uh, you know, uh, breaking open a, a, a pinata and out falls all the people that he wants to execute and kill. They had to fight and fight a vicious fight and lost so many millions of people. And we lost a few hundred thousand. And so it's not like we haven't done this and it's not like we necessarily wouldn't do it again under the proper circumstances. But right now we just ended the Afghanistan war this past year and um, Iraq went on for so long. We are not allowed to do this president Zelensky and 
the, the whole thing about that we have some responsibility or that we should feel guilty about this or whatever. Well, let us feel guilty. I do feel guilty. I wish that we could protect this entire planet in more ways than one, not just when it comes to war. But we are a miserable failure at that, and you cannot ask us to do that which we really have not been successful in doing since World War II. And to the media, stop it. Stop it. All these stories every day, every night. What are you trying to do? All the stories. Are, you've got reporters at the train stations and showing an awful situation with a million or two million refugees. Oh, it's, it is awful. We don't need you manipulating the truth. The truth is hard enough. We all feel it. How many of those Ukrainians, by the way, um, have we uh, put on planes to come here? Move them here. The people that have had to leave. I don't know the exact number, but I'll tell you it ain't many. <laughs> Refugees in America? Foreigners? No. That's not us. That's not us. Unless you can prove to the Republicans that if you bring them here, they'll vote for Republicans. That, that's how it worked under Reagan and before him with the Cubans and the Vietnamese. Anybody, anybody who would pledge their loyalty to the Republicans that would increase their votes in those places in the country where they were brought talk about manipulation, talk about using them, but no, this can't happen, my friends. And I don't want to belabor this, uh, really any longer. I just, I want to, I want to say that I am opposed to any form of war when, when it involves the United States of America. Um, I want the news media, uh, to tell the truth and to tell the actual the actual political story that's going on. Um, I want to hear what's being done in Russia with the Russian people, what they're planning to do to get rid of Putin, to take him out, to stop him. I want to know what's their military doing. That would be real reporting, wouldn't it? What are the oligarchs doing? I just I see the one oligarch just lost the Chelsea football team there in England. You know, a lot of them have lost their yachts. This is serious stuff. I want to know more about that because that may lead to the end of this more than anything else. So what I'm asking for to all of you who are listening to Rumble is, first of all, I hope I've earned your trust over the years um, from the various movies I've made about the various lies we've been told and, um, and the various movements we've all joined over these years to fight against what is done in our name and with our tax dollars. I'm asking you to join with me. Contact your representatives right to the White House, whitehouse.gov, and tell them that we are opposed to war. War is not the answer, especially not an American war. <laughs> it's been, what now, 70... 77 years since we've been useful in that regard, it's not now. To all of you who are parents out there and you have a teenager, boy or girl, are you willing to sacrifice them? You, would you give up their life tonight so that we can save Kiev? Look at your children right now. And I don't care what age, they're five, they're 10, they're 15, they're 20. Just say to yourself, yeah, you know, uh, little Jason here, eh, yeah, he's a good kid, love him, love him to death. 
He part his death, though. I'd be willing for him to die to get Odessa back. You can't do it, can you? No. There are things that all of us would be willing to give our lives for. And I think the number one thing that each of us would be willing to give our lives for would be to keep our children alive. That's why we're not letting them go off to war. And you cannot sit there as you listen to me and say, well, no, I think we should, we should be in there. We should uh, go into, we should no, no fly and all. You know, we should do that. Um, because of course your kids are not in the military. So let somebody else's child die. <sighs> let your neighbor's child, let your cousin's child die so we can get back the Chernobyl nuclear plant. <sighs> can you say that? Or let's just be more honest here. Let the children of the poor and the working class, let them die. I give them up. Really? Let the children of black Americans and brown Americans, let them die. That's who's going to die, by the way. You know that. I didn't need to say it, did I? Really? White people, my friends, please, come on. Let's be honest. No American dies. We are smart people. We have smart people. We can help in some ingenious ways to bring this to an end, to stop Putin. But we're not participating in World War III, and we need to say that loud and clear. You need to write to your representatives, your senators, Biden, no World War III. Nothing that would ignite a war like that. No Americans in Ukraine. No Americans in Russia. NATO? That's such an old idea. It should have gone down as soon as the Berlin Wall came down. Cold War was over. Why is there still a NATO? We have to make our voices heard right now. It won't take long. Call your representative uh, or your senator. You know the Capitol Hill switchboard number by now. 202-224-3121. If it's busy, try 202-225-3121. It's open pretty much 24 hours of the day, a human will answer, call them, and tell them no Americans in Ukraine or Russia and no American support of NATO. There are other ways to stop Putin. Let's be smart. Let's employ those methods. And let's support the Ukrainian people in every way that we can. I will put on this platform page here a link or two if you want to send money to help the refugee uh, situation. There's a number of ways to help the Ukrainian people, and we should all do that. But we will not be barging in with our guns and our tanks and our planes. And if Biden changes his mind and if he decides to do that or if he decides to get all up on his NATO horse, then we have got to get into the streets and we have got to let them know, no, no, this is not the way to end the killing of the people in Ukraine. So please call your senators, your representatives, call the White House, write to the White House, let them know. And President Zelensky we're here for you in every other way. And you don't really want us there. That's like the dumbest thing to do. To let us meddle in this thing and mess it up even more. I'm hoping those of you who are listening to me 
are agreeing with this. If you don't agree, I respect you. I understand. I'm just saying we've tried the other way. It hasn't worked. We lost the Iraqi war. We lost the Afghanistan war. We lost the Vietnam war. That's just the truth. Hard to swallow when we've got we're number one written all over our chest. But that's the truth. I'm open to hearing any ideas that you have, you who are listening. Uh, any, let's hear some smart ideas. I'll, I'll talk about it here on Rumble. Ways that we can help that don't involve us showing up unannounced. Thanks so much uh, for listening uh, to this uh, today. Um, and um, I, I would love to hear your feedback, but please don't sit, don't sit this one out. We need to be active. Um, and media, Jesus, find a different storyline. <laughs> please. Please. That's it for me today here on Rumble with Michael Moore. I'm Michael Moore. I'd like to thank our executive producer, Basil Hamden, our uh, producer and editor, Angela Vargos, our other editor and uh, sound engineer, Nick Quaz, and our jack of all the trades, uh, Donald Bornstein. Uh, thanks to everybody who helps me um, with this podcast. Thanks to all of you who listen, and uh, we'll talk soon here. I'm Michael Moore. And um, have a good day.